Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us today. My name is Kyle Barnhart and I'm with the GVSU Alumni Relations Office. I'm joined today by Melissa Perino from GVSU's Center for Adult and Continuing Studies and today's presenter, Dr. Diana Lawson, Dean of the Seedman College of Business. This monthly webinar series is a partnership between Alumni Relations and the Center for Adult and Continuing Studies and features a range of road hitting topics for your professional and personal life. Today's webinar topic is Leading Change. Here to take us through this thought-provoking session that includes insights from her personal and professional experience is Diana Lawson. Diana is the Dean of the Seedman College of Business. She has extensive experience leading business programs and a wealth of international practice. In her six years with GVSU, Diana has helped redefine the focus of the Seedman College to embrace the theme of knowing doing and being to help business majors grow professionally and personally. With a background in marketing and international business, she teaches leading change and emerging trends courses in the executive MBA program. Prior to joining GVSU, she served as Dean of the Business School at St. Cloud State University and has held positions as an invited and visiting professor and scholar at universities in France, Moldova, and Turkey, as well as Harvard University. Diana was recently named by Cranes as a notable woman in higher education leadership. One of her greatest strengths is leading change, uh, which she will focus on today. Thank you, Kyle. And thank you, Diana, for being with us today. Change is certainly something that we've all experienced a lot of lately in both of our professional and personal roles. And we wanna thank the participants that have joined us today and have chosen to dedicate some time to thinking about leading change as opposed to just managing or reacting to change. I'm going to go over a few housekeeping or Zoom keeping things before we get started. Uh, we will be using the Q&A box that you should find at the bottom of your screen uh, today because we want to make this engaging and the way that you can engage with us and with Diana is to submit some questions in that Q&A box. Your chat feature is also open, but we'll mostly be watching those questions and, and looking for those. We'll uh, save most of the questions for the end of the conversation of the dialogue. And we'll also be using the poll feature a bit today too. So be prepared for your responses to some questions that we'll pepper throughout the presentation. And uh, we are recording this, this presentation and yes, you will get a copy of the recording afterwards uh, that should be in your inbox by the end of the week along with the recording you'll also get a copy of the slide deck that diana will be sharing with us today so i'm going to share a screen and we will get started with a poll in just a moment pardon my awkwardness here Kyle, will you queue up the poll for us? When thinking about the change that you've been experiencing over the past several months, how are you feeling about it? What are you trying to do? And note we didn't put bury my head in the sand as an option, although many of us <laughs> want it to do that many days. Exactly, many of us are, are reacting to or managing change as opposed to thinking about leading it and really driving it. So Diana, your work is cut out for you today. And we recognize we only have about an hour together, so uh, we'll get started. Thanks, Melissa. Thanks, Kyle. And thank you all for, for tuning in or Zooming in to this webinar. It's an unusual format for me in leading change because normally this is done in a, a two-way, at least a two-way or three-way or many-way, multi-way conversation. But we, we will hopefully um, help you all to see uh, a path forward in change and how all of you can help to impact the change regardless of where you are in your organization. So as we start to think about change, 
uh, I have a few bullet points here that I really want you to start thinking about. Uh, think about your experiences over the last four to five months. We've all had the same, this, this same trigger that has caused us to look differently at how we did work, how we do our work, and how we lead others. So think through that over the last four or five months. We never expected this to happen, and we all have had to pivot. None of our organizations are the same today as they were on January 1st or February 1st of this year. And those changes are probably changes that are not just short-term temporary. Of course, there are some things that are. But what this, this COVID uh, environment has made me realize, and I think a lot of other leaders, is that the way we always normally did business may not be the way we normally do business a year from now. And it's one thing we all have in common. So think about these. And as we go through, as we go through the slides and as we go through the next hour, if you have questions or comments, please, in, please put them into the Q&A or chat. Uh, wherever you, know, you, you can put them in here. And I, I will give you one <laughs> piece of, of information about me is I'm not really great with technology. So I'm depending on Kyle and Melissa, but they will, they will make sure that we get questions and comments to share with everybody. So think through that and think through how, how difficult has the, the four or five months been. And how much, have, how much time have you spent just trying to take care of tasks, putting fires out, versus how many of you have actually thought about what are we going to look like six months from now? What are we going to look like a year from now? And what can I do today to make sure that we get where we need to go six months, a year from now? That's what leading change is about. That's what leadership is about. Many of us are in the middle of an organization you don't have to be at the top of an organization to lead. You can lead from wherever you are in that organization. So what I want to talk about is I want to, I, what I want to pro provide you is a simple framework. Um, can we go to the next slide? A simple framework that is a change framework that works. It's by John Cotter. He's been doing this for decades. John Cotter is at, out of Harvard. And it's simple, there are eight steps, easy to remember. It provides a common language for change for all of the people within your organization. And over the decades and through a lot of research that they've done, it works and it works very well. So let's move on to, to the framework. As I said, there were eight steps and we, you know, we, we only have, we have less than an hour. We don't have time to go through all eight steps uh, in, in any detail. So I've chosen some of the steps that are really important. And I think I noticed that one of our EMBA students is on this call. Uh, this doesn't mean you can't come to class in a few weeks. So the steps, step one, establish a sense of urgency. There has to be urgency. You have, step two is a guiding coalition. You have to have the right people on the bus in the right places. You have to create a vision, communicate that vision, empower others, make sure you identify and, and celebrate short-term wins, consolidate improvements and keep changing, and institutionalize new approaches. Now, generally, overall, there are eight steps. Do you need all eight steps? Absolutely, you need all eight steps. And what we have found in talking to businesses and in talking with my students who have uh, responsible positions in the organizations in which they work, they've got, they have gone through change initiatives. And, and when we talked about their change initiatives, they said sometimes they worked and sometimes they didn't. So when we put the framework, when we applied what they did to the framework, they noticed that they had missed some steps. And some of the steps seem easy. Some of them might seem a little bit more difficult. They're all, they all require a great deal of attention, a great deal of diligence, and they all need to be there in order to make change stick. So let's start with urgency. 
urgency means we must have evidence of the rationale as to why the change is needed. And it must target both our head, meaning it needs to be objective, but it also has to target our emotions and our heart to really help people understand the need for change. It has to affect us effect, effectively. It has to affect us uh, from, from the emotional side as well as from the head side. So let's look at COVID. COVID, for the most part, well, let me, let me step back. COVID, we have people, as you watch, read the news, as you talk to people, people are on two sides of the fence. People say that we're going to an extreme. Other people say we're, we, we're, we're not doing enough. Why are there two different sides to this? One side is looking maybe only at the obje objective data, and there's a lot of different data out there about COVID. Some of it's really accurate, some of it's not. But how those people, the people who are on the extreme that, oh, it's just another virus, and they just look at the data. When the heart comes in, someone they know gets ill, um, someone close to them, someone far away, depends on how close. Once the heart comes in, they start to understand how to mesh the two. And I'm going to give you an example here from, from um, a, a professional who works in a, a hospital situation. The hospital that that this person worked at, they were really, they had an ER, so they had an ER uh, entrance. And right before the ER entrance, of course, was parking lot. And they had set up the parking lot so that the, the parking spaces close to the entrance were really for patients and patient families. And then the, the staff were supposed to park farther away. But they had a really hard time trying to get the staff to follow along. So they started a change initiative and they kept kept putting signs up and talking about it. And it would get a little bit better when they first talked about it, and then it would go back so that the staff were, were parking close by. And the patients, they'd drop off their loved one, and then, then the family would have to go find a place to park and then walk back up to the ER. So think about this. If you have a loved one who has to go to the ER, they're having a heart attack or some, some kind of urgent need, you have to go and leave that person at ER, and then you have to go and find a place to park. And then how long is that going to take? So how long are you willing to stay away from your loved one in order to follow the rules and find a place to park? One minute, three minutes, five minutes. And it's very stressful. And they were, so the hospital was getting nowhere. They really were not making any progress. So what they did is they did a video. And they did a video of a woman bringing her husband in. This was an actual patient. Bring her husband in because he was having signs of a heart attack. And they reenacted what she had lived through when she brought him in. She dropped him off. She drove around and around the parking lot to finally find a parking place. And then she had to walk up to the ER. It took her between 10 and 15 minutes to get back to her husband in the ER. So think about that and think about how you would feel about that if that was your spouse or your child or your boyfriend or your girlfriend and you had to do that. They showed the video to the staff and they never had another parking issue. They understood the urgency when they saw it and felt it, not just when they heard about it. So urgency has to be both head and heart. And sometimes you have to be creative. That video was brilliant. And it was an idea of one of the people in the, in, that were trying to lead through this change initiative. So sometimes urgency requires creativity. It always requires some level of data. You have to have both. It has to be clear. And normally you have to have about 75% buy-in if you really want the urgency to continue to be relevant and strong enough to lead through change. When we think about change, many times we think about change as being 
we're, we're starting in one place, we want to get to another, and we think, we, we, we think of it as a task. Change and leading change is not a task. It is a long-term viewpoint, like a marathon as opposed to a sprint. It, it, change takes a lot of time. So can you do it all by yourself? No. You need to have the right people in the what Cotter calls the guiding coalition. You need to have the right people. And the guiding coalition is not dependent on, on the position the person holds. It should be based on work and thinking styles. So one of the biggest errors people make when they're trying to lead a change initiative is they automatically think, well, this person is the VP of such and such. This person's the director. And they start choosing people based on the hierarchy within the organization. The harder the change, the more times you have to go outside that hierarchy. Because if you're having an issue and, and that requires change, guess what's causing that issue? It's a hierarchy. You don't have alignment of the higher people in the hierarchy to, be, to see the need to do things differently than the way they've been done. And so in looking for people with different styles, you want people to have strengths and people who think differently than the way you do. If you have a lot of people who think just like you, you it's not going to help you. It's just going to be more of group think according to the way that you think. You need someone who's really good at getting things done. You need someone who's really creative and can think outside the box. You need someone who has strong relationships and can build strong relationships with people. You need someone that has credibility and trust amongst the majority of the people in the organization that you are trying to influence in that change. So this is the really hard part, is finding the people and having the courage to not choose somebody that is thinks that that person should be thinks he or she should be in the guiding coalition because of their position and you should cross levels of the hierarchy people all the way up and down the organization and what this means is you really need to know the strengths of the people around you of your team of other people of your team and then the teams of each of the people on your team so that you can choose the people who are willing to take risks, who can think outside the box, and who can work together to see a future that looks different from what you're doing today. There's also a group of individuals that we call affectionately no-nos. And so as I say no-nos, no-nos are the people who find something wrong with everything you want to do. So as I say that, are different people coming to mind? If you give it about a minute's worth, probably less than a minute's worth of thinking, you can think of people that you've interacted with either occasionally or on a regular basis who, who seem to criticize everything and find fault in everything that wants to be done. No-nos are important because no-nos help you to understand where some of the obstacles are in terms of people, how people think. No-nos are also very important because they will try and build a stronger uh, affiliation with others to pull more people towards their side instead of following your side in terms of leading forward with the change. And as the saying goes, what is the saying? Keep your friends close and your enemies closer. Keep your no-nos close. Make sure that you know what they're doing and make sure that you have someone to help neutralize them. Give them something to do that will benefit the company but not hurt your change, uh, your change vision and initiative as you move forward. Um, and at the end of this, I, will, there's a, I have a list of referen re references for reading. And there is a great book. It's a, it's a fable based on Cotter's Eight Steps about a bunch of penguins in their iceberg and they find out that their iceberg is melting. And so they have to learn how to change and do things differently in order to survive. It's a great book 
and to identify the different kinds of characteristics you need in the people in your guiding coalition. Your guiding coalition is critical because if you don't have the right people in the right positions, it's going to be much more difficult. And as I said, anything, if anything seems confusing or if you don't agree with something or have questions or even, even if you have some examples of some of your experiences, please put them into the chat or into the Q&A. And uh, Melissa or Kyle will, will help us share them. So the third step I want to talk about is communicate vision. But be, urgency is step one. Guiding coalition is step two. The third step is create a vision. Creating your vision is critical. And your vision has to be long-term, simple easy to understand by people with varying perspectives and at varying levels of the organization. When you're creating your vision and putting together your plan, it's not just for you and the people around you and your team, it's for the entire organization. So once you've created your vision, you have to communicate the vision. And the first bullet point here is the most important. Communicate it, communicate it, and communicate it more. And if you think you've communicated it enough, you haven't. You need to continue to communicate it. It has to be communicated in different forms for the different audiences, because how you talk to your, your senior VP level is going to be very different from how you talk to the staff or the support staff um, that are farther down in the hierarchy. And I'm talking about a hierarchy because I would say as I looked through the list of the people who are, are on, this, on this webinar, uh, at least those of you that I know, all of your organizations have pretty strong hierarchies. And all of your organizations really use those hierarchies. And one thing about West Michigan and really about the Midwest is, and about the US is so many of our companies, the organizational hierarchy and the organizational culture is extremely strong. When you're leading change, you're trying to modify that organizational culture or you're trying to, to help it to turn in a different direction. And it's, that is extremely, extremely challenging. So communicating across the levels of a, of a hierarchy are really important for buy-in and for understanding. It has to be at all levels. And as you go down to all levels, you'll find people at, lo at levels below you and levels above you that will be, would be great on guiding coalitions for your change initiatives. If you look at healthcare, and if you look at uh, food, grocery stores, Family Fair and Meyer for us in our area, those two industries have undergone massive change as a result of COVID. If you think, think about yourself and think about your friends, your neighbors, your family, how have your shopping habits changed in terms of groceries and, and other things? How many of you don't go to the grocery store anymore? You just get on your computer, type away, and all of a sudden it shows up at your door. And how many of you have just Driven, driven someplace to pick something up. One of my favorite outcomes of the COVID uh, crisis is curbside pickup, mostly for takeout as opposed to grocery stores. But it's great not having to get out of my car that I can just go and take, take a drive and pick something up and home and I don't have to clean up the kitchen. So that's perfect. But think about those changes and then think through those changes and Think about the organizations and how they've had to change the way they do things. So for Meyer, for example, one of the things that they have been working on, they've had shipped for a long time where you can, well, for a couple of years, where you can type in whatever you make an order and somebody from shipped will do the shopping for you and then deliver it to you. The demand was so, has been so high with COVID is that Meyer has had to start creating their own type of ship in order to keep up with customer demand. 
did they ever expect to have to do that? Maybe, but if they expected it, they probably thought it was a long-term, oh, maybe three, three or to five years down the road. We'll see how this works. No, they, they, in order to serve you, serve me, serve us, they have had to change the way they do things. At the major hospitals and looking at Spectrum, um, they had to change completely how they were serving patients, serving clients, and they had to depend on people up and down the complete hierarchy in order to keep things running. It wasn't their normal way of doing business. It wasn't in their plan, but they had to do that. The vision was always the same in terms of safety and health of our patients and staff. The vision has to be simple. The vision has to be consistent and easily communicated and then easily interpreted by the people who are listening. Many organizations make visions far too complicated. For us at Seedman, the vision, although we have never written out what our vision is, our vision for change has always been student success, student-centered success, to help students learn better, to help them navigate through their curriculum, to help them be prepared for their careers and help them improve. That's pretty simple. And whenever anybody would come to me and want to make any kind of change, oh, they're thinking about a new idea here, there, whatever it is, say, okay, so how does this help students? And, and then higher ed, for those of you, there are some on the call who are actually in, in the university. We always get into an argument about, well, what do the faculty want? What do the students want? What do the staff want? And, and what clarifies all of that as we start to have these conversations is when we step up or I step up and I say, okay, how does this improve student learning? How does this improve student success? And then there's quiet and people think, and then they start shifting the way they're thinking to the student. It's a simple vision, students, student success, student learning, student learning outcomes. Over, this t over the time I've been here six years, as, as uh, Kyle noted in my introduction, we changed our curriculum to include three components, knowledge, application, experiential learning, and personal and professional development. And those three components, whenever any of our faculty or units have wanted to change their curriculum, I said, this is what has to be in the curriculum. You want a new course? Show me. You want a new program? Show me. And it, it hasn't changed in terms of what I've always asked for. And what the results have been is that we now, now our faculty and our staff, whenever they're thinking about curriculum, they think, know, do, and be. And they talk in those terms, and they explain and discuss in those terms. Six years, I've been here for six years. Change doesn't happen fast. But communicating the vision is critical and that vision has to be consistent, almost like we're a broken record. So early on when I talked about a guiding coalition and when we talked about when in the very beginning about having to lead change, one of the things I said is you cannot do this alone. You cannot do it alone. If you try to do it alone, it won't work. And empowering others is really, really important. It requires that you have people throughout the organization over the timeline of change of the initiative. So that means you don't just find five people early on and you're always going to use those five people. You keep bringing people in and out as the change continues to move forward. You learn how to observe and listen to find the people who get it. And if you're an observant person, then you will understand this in terms of moving into it. When you go into a new organization or a new role, you start talking to people, listening to them, watching them, and identifying who has what skills and who has the skills to think creatively outside the box, willing to take risks, 
and can be part of a guiding coalition. And if you don't do that, it's a good habit to get into. Watching and listening, you learn much more than talking. And if you are trying to lead change, having open minds, an open mind as you are watching, helps you to find people that you never thought might be uh, helpful in any kind of a change initiative. Now, if you're one of those people, and many of you may be thinking, yeah, but I'm in a position where I can't really lead change. You might not be. You might not be in a position where you can lead change, but you certainly are in a position where you might be able to be part of the guiding coalition. And you may be able to step up if somebody gave you some opportunity to help move the change initiative forward. But you have to step up and ask and not be passive and wait but step up and say, you know, we really need, I see what you're trying to do. I think I can do this to help. And then think about what their vision, the vision of the change initiative is, and then move forward with it. Being passive, you may get asked, you may not get asked, but, they, but step up. What's the worst that could happen? They can say, no, thank you. We don't really need that right now. But most of the time, whenever anybody steps up and says, I want to help, I find something for them to do that helps to move our vision forward. So short-term wins. These are really important to, to identify. And if you can't identify them, to... Um, Create some short-term wins. Short-term wins show, so you start in one place, you're here and you wanna get your change initiative here. How long is that gonna take? A couple of years probably, but in my case six. But it takes a long time. But you can't wait to get to the end to say, oh look, we've accomplished it. There are many milestones along the way where you can find short-term wins but you have to keep at it. So sometimes, and you have to be observant and think about them. Sometimes you can create them by saying, okay, when we reach X, everybody's going to get a $5 gift card from Starbucks, or we're going to have a donut party or whatever it is we're going to do. Or it could be that you have a, a screen on your web, on your internal website, or in your break room, and I know this is different now, but in your break room where you have a, a poster that puts different people's names up because they've accomplished something or they've done something that is related to the change initiative. For some people, this seems, well, why do you even need to do that? I know I'm doing a good job. Yes, for some, some people are like that, but most people want to have some level of recognition to know they've done a good job and that they have actually contributed to the change initiative we're trying to accomplish. Short-term wins are really important. So we, were, we have been, here's an example. As most of you know, we have a lot of students in Seedman. Over the last six years, we have grown to become the largest under, accredited undergraduate business school in the, in the state. We weren't that when I started we've grown 25 to 30% in the last six years. The last year we've stayed pretty steady, but up until last year, we continued to grow. How did we do that? We, we, there was the demand, but we did that because we continued to focus on the curriculum to the no do be and to focus on student success. When I asked students in first year students in a class last year, I said, well, what made you choose us over all the other business schools? And, other universities in Michigan and other places. And, and many of them said, because we know you have a really good business school. You, the, the programs are good. So they know because they hear it from their friends, because the uh, people who come before them from their communities and who um, had really gotten really good jobs and started, started nice careers. So with all the, anyway, with all these students, we have, a core curriculum. And in that core curriculum for every single course, every single semester, 
we would have 10 to 15 sections. So if you think about trying to have quality and consistency in learning outcomes, when you have 10 to 15 sections of the same course with different faculty teaching, the question is, how do you make this happen? And so we've worked on really trying to have more consistency across sections. So one of the things we did with one of our core courses, it's actually a pre-core course, uh, is we made it hybrid. So half of the course, one and a half credits, was online, and the other half was face-to-face, -face, kind of like a biology class. You think of biology or chemistry, where you'd have big lecture sections and, and you'd have a lot of content, and then you'd have a lab where you would practice what you learned. Uh, in our case, it was a discussion of a case or hands-on learning in terms of how to use a program. And in this course, it was a computer course, uh, information systems course, we had one person who taught the core content, the one and a half credits of the core content. She taught a whole bunch of students, 300 and something. And then we had a number of faculty who taught the discussion session sections. We took that course and we compared the learning outcomes of the students in that hybrid course to the learning outcomes of students in, course, in sections that we still kept some separate sections, full three credit sections, of the learning outcomes of the students in courses that were taught by three different faculty members. The learning outcomes in the hybrid course were 20% better than the independent courses. We had no idea it was going to come out that way, but that was an absolute short-term win, and we let everybody know because it reinforced the focus of consistency in delivery and in content for our students and their learning. Go back to the leading change, the urgency for consistency and improved learning outcomes and the vision for consistency and learning outcomes and improved student success. It was all there, the short-term win helped to reinforce that. You never know when they're going to come. You have to always take advantage of them. And sometimes you have to create them. And for some people, it may seem that short-term wins are just a bother, but they're not because to the people in the organization across all levels of a hierarchy, it means you're watching and it means that you are taking um, seriously what they do and that you really appreciate them and what they do. So throughout all this, before we go to the next section, throughout all of this, if you have not kind of come to this conclusion, leading change is not about the tasks that have to get done. It wasn't about the curriculum. It wasn't about the actual course. Leading change is about the people. And it's you're, what you're really trying to change is the organizational culture and the people and their mindset and how they think about doing their jobs and about the organization. Leading is about people, managing is about tasks. All of you do a little bit of both. So you have to think about the two and break them apart. Managing, you have to manage tasks. Everybody, we all have to manage tasks, whether we like it or not. But if you can't divide and also spend some time on leading people, the tasks will always take over. It has to be deliberate and intentional in terms of how you split your time and the way you think, because you have to use different parts of your thinking when you're leading a task versus leading, when you're managing a task versus leading people. The more you practice, the better you get at it. The higher up you go in a hierarchy, the more time you spend leading people, less time you spend managing tasks. In a crisis, what I see is so many people in many organizations have just been focused on the tasks of what we're doing today. And they're not thinking out beyond December or fourth quarter. The companies I've talked to that have been 
that are doing well and really starting to pivot and can see the way forward, they're thinking about the people, they're leading the people, and they're thinking about two years from now, three years from now, where will we be? You have to have both, but you have to intentionally make yourself think beyond. Otherwise, those tasks are going to overtake your entire life. And I bet if we could see you all, you'd all be saying, yep, these tasks are taking up so much of my time. You have to step back and say, a little bit of time, you have to step back and say, okay, what do we need to be doing now in order to be secure or sustainable a year from now? So the last two, set, the last two steps in the process are really important as well, but we really don't have time to do all of that. I don't, no, we don't. So, um, Melissa, so it takes time, a lot of time, and there are a lot of obstacles. So I think, Melissa, you have a poll here, don't you? So this poll is really just taking a look at those steps of, of Cotter's model or framework that you spoke about. I'm really thinking as you think about how you've been managing or leading change over the past several months or over your career, what, what is most challenging for you? I love watching the, the poll results come in, right? Um, yep, and it looks like most of the folks that re responded really talked about that uh, establishing a sense of urgency, yeah. which is, right? Connecting that head and heart piece that you spoke about. And boy, if we haven't had a sense of urgency with this past experience, right? I don't know when we'll have something. So these more. are pretty interesting results. Um, can the most what we have is that the communicating the vision, 30% have said that's most challenging. And they're, you're absolutely right. I, I think part of the challenge we have in, ter in terms of communicating a vision, and I know this is one of my flaws, is I think if I say it once, people should get it. Or maybe I have to say it twice. But to say the same thing over and over and over, it took me a heck of a lot of practice to do that. And there are still many times, and there are some people from Steedman that are on this, this webinar, and probably around other places around the university, they can see my frustration when I have to explain again and again what we're trying to do and where we're trying to go. So I, I, it, is, it is hard, and it's not something that you learn and you can just do it. You have to keep reminding yourself. You have to communicate it in different formats to, do, to make sure that you're reaching all of the, the people who are listening. That's why it's so important to, it, to keep it simple because it's much easier to, if you keep it simple, to communicate it and to repeat it over and over. And when you do that, people start to remember it. I would say that probably if you ask the people in Seedman, the faculty and staff in Seedman, what our vision is, and people ask, what's our vision? And I, I don't give them and say, well, you know, we don't have a vision that's written out. But they can tell you the main components of what our vision is. And they can tell you the direction that we're going in, even if they can't tell you in the, right, in the words that might be a vision. So communicating that is really, really important. And it's really hard to do for some of us. The sense of urgency um, is harder than we think. We think that we have the have established urgency, and we maybe have established urgency at the top level or whatever level you are. Whatever level you are, there may be urgency, and that urgency might be the level above you, maybe a little bit the level below you. But what about the rest of the organization? 
do they know it? And some of the research, what it shows is that urgency, it, it's in pockets, it's really strong. But until that urgency permeates the entire organization, the impact and effect of that change is not going to be what we expect. And then it starts to, to whittle away. And once you have, you may create urgency in the beginning, but you have to continue reinforcing it, whether it's with new data or new stories of how things are done. And sometimes the data will help you create the story for the heart so that you can see how both work together. Um, and there, and in the references, there's a book called The Heart of Change. And it, go, it goes step by step of the eight steps and, and company, it provides examples from companies that have gone through this process and what they've done to reinforce urgency with the heart as well as with the head and how they put the two of them together. Uh, so, so urgency it shouldn't be taken lightly and urgency has to be reinforced throughout the whole leading change um, process. So what we, when I first came in here six years ago, I honestly couldn't, nobody could answer my questions about, about our um, specifics, about our enrollment, about the trends that we've had. So how's it changed over the last five years? What are the big, what are, how have each of the majors changed? How have we uh, looked at our seat capacity? All of that, most of that had not been done on a regular basis. So we started putting all this data together and we started putting the budget together in, in by unit. And once in my first, this is my first semester, we got the budget together and my associate dean, um, who is great with data, and he, we went in and we presented it and I gave the whole budget for the college to the whole, my leadership team, which are my department chairs, my deans, my associate deans, assistant deans. And what they said to me, they looked at it. And they said, you know, we've never seen this before. They said, what do you mean you've never seen this before? They said, well, we've seen our own budgets, but we've never seen the whole college budget. And I just stopped and I, I said, oh, I said, well, if you don't see the whole, whole college budget, how can you help me make decisions? And they agreed. But that right there started to establish a sense of urgency. And we needed to change the way that we did things. Because if we don't all have the budget and the data, they won't know the why behind why I make decisions the way I do. And they will not be able to help me understand how to manage faculty resources with enrollment with the number of students we have in each department as we need to shift and reallocate resources. The urgency started right there in a way that I never expected it to start. So, um, yes. I'm going to jump in. I want to make sure we have a few minutes for questions. So um, okay. we have about 10 minutes left. If you okay. have any final thoughts you want to get out or if you want to go right into questions. Okay, so let's do the obstacles to change. And then I saw that there was one question in the Q&A, which I will respond to. Okay. Um, employee, so obstacles to change, these are huge. Risk averse, many employees are risk averse. They, they are afraid of change. They are, they're obstinate, they just don't want to change. And there are the no-nos who know a better way or, or people who always know a different way. And there are other forms of resistance with people. I'm sure you can think of them as you're listening through all of this. A big error that people make is they claim victory too soon. Change should become part of the organizational culture. And as soon as you think you've succeeded, Think again, go back to the, the, the framework and figure out what still needs to be done. And the research shows that if you don't include all eight steps, your change is not going to stick as effectively as what you want it to. And, the, and if you've had uh, change initiatives that, are really, that you've gone through and they've kind of worked, take the eight steps, apply what you did to these eight steps and you'll find out what you missed that you can go back and, and try and fill in to improve the strength of the change. 
So then the last slide that I have is, these are the readings. Leading change, why transformation efforts fail. That's an article that summarizes the next book, Leading Change. I talked about hard change. Talked about how iceberg is melting. And then that's not how we do it here is another fable by John Cotter that helps to uh, blend change with innovation. The six thinking hats, if you haven't heard it, it's worth reading. It's about how people think differently. Thank you so much for this presentation and for joining us. Um, we'll make sure to stick these further reading um, also in the follow-up email along with the webinar recording. Um, Melissa, do you want to facilitate a little conversation here, a little q and I saw we had one come in and I know you maybe have a couple others as well. Yes, I would love to. Thank you, Kyle. I'm going to stop sharing that screen there. So, you know, Diana, thank you so very much. And I think you spoke a lot about organizations and yet I also hear it applying personally, right? As you spoke about that guiding coalition, I thought about how I have that with, with, with friends or people that I know who sort of help me make decisions personally. When you spoke about know, do, and be, I think this has made many of us think about what we know, do, and be. The question, one of the questions that was in the, the Q&A was really speaking to that guiding coalition and saying, are there any tools or methods that you would recommend uh, to, to folks to actually, who may be new to an organization, to sort of build that? What's the best way to do that? I I, I think that's a good question, and it's it's. Uh, thank you, Kalita, for for and for asking that question. I, I think there are a couple of things. One, you just over time as a leader, you build the ability to do that. You listen and observe, and you identify people who think differently. But there are assessments, and we do use we use an assessment, a local assessment, the Pondera PBA. When we put students in groups, because we put them in groups, groups based on their diversity of skills and the way that they think and the way that they work. But there are other methods you can use as well to do that, whether it's an MBTI assessment uh, and their performance and how many times have they really come up with new solutions and different ideas. You have to learn to watch people and observe them. But the Six Thinking Hats book, and there's an article about it, talks about six different ways of thinking. And those six different ways of thinking, you need all of them if you want to make good decisions. And, and those thinking ways align with the differences in their, in their um, work styles and in, in their, their different skills that they have. You just learn how to do it. You really do. And we have certainly had to use many different ways of thinking and, and being over the past several months. Um, we also, you know, you gave us some great advice and some specific steps that we need to follow as we think about leading change. I know Kyle's going to drop a link to filling out a, a survey about today's webinar in the, the chat box, and we would ask the attendees if you'd go ahead and fill that piece out. Um, our last slide also had, you know, we call this series Lakers Learn More because they do, that it's in their, the fabric of their being. And Diana, if they want to learn more about Seedman College of Business, they can go right to the gbsu.edu site slash Seedman and uh, find more opportunities and learn more about some of the work that you are doing and some of the changes that you have made as well. We thank you um, for being here with us today. And if there are no other questions, uh, I do see Kyle's dropped that, that link in there. You've given us homework that we need to do as well. Maybe re dig a little bit into some of those uh, further reading resources and thank you for that. We uh, are really looking forward to seeing some, some more changes that you'll be leading as well. So thank you for being here today with us, for spending your time thinking and talking and thank you to our attendees. Thank you. My pleasure. And thanks for all of you being here.